Well, good day, everybody, and welcome to Lecture 8 as we journey through the wonderful Gospel of Matthew. Today we're looking at chapters 23 to 25, the second last of our time with Matthew. And I'm calling this one the Great Judgment Discourse. There is a bit of an argument about how to divide these three chapters, 23, 24 and 25. It's where Jesus is continuing his teaching on this great Tuesday before the Passover. But I rather like the New International Bible version uh, with Eugene Boring. He gives us a structure where he argues that the whole of these three chapters belong to a final discourse of Jesus centered on judgment. A judgment on the contemporary synagogue, chapter 23, and a judgment, the coming judgment, and how to, how to cope with that, chapters 24 and 25. And he would say that this long discourse, these three chapters, correspond to the great long discourse at the beginning, the Sermon on the Mount. There's a bit of a balance there. And it also say that just as there were blessings in the Sermon on the Mount, Beatitudes, so in this one there are woes to counterbalance the blessings. So there's something about what he says that appeals to me. However, most of the commentators, it must be said, reserve the title of the uh, judgment discourse, sometimes called the eschatological discourse. It's a beautiful word, isn't it? Eschaton is the Greek word for the end times. What's going to happen at the end of the world sort of stuff. So that's what the eschaton, the eschatological discourse is all about. Okay, so I'm going to look at uh, two major things. The first one is judgment on the present, chapter 23, and then judgment on the future or the coming judgment, chapters 24 and 25. And each of those two judgments of our present time and the coming judgment will have three sections. And this first one, judgment of the present, the three sections are, there are warnings about the Pharisees. Why Pharisees? Well, again, the Pharisees of the synagogue are the chief group that the Jewish Christians with Matthew are sort of arguing with. Then there are the woes against the Pharisees and their way of, of following the Torah. And the final thing, the third final thing, is the lament over the city of Jerusalem. Okay. Let's look at the first thing, some of those uh, warnings against the Pharisees. We know that after the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, a good generation after Jesus, and with it was destroyed the priestly aristocracy and the Sadducees, it was only the Pharisees who managed to keep Judaism going and flourishing. And they extended the priestly code to the whole nation so that every Jew had to follow the rules that formerly the priests followed because now we are a, a priestly nation. The priesthood resides in all of us, so we must keep all those rules. Which meant that, of course, many Jewish people felt burdened. Will they lift a finger to lift these burdens? Not they. And we remember Jesus saying that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. The second thing about these the warnings about the Pharisees come from this other fact that when the Pharisees got uh, tried to get Judaism go, continuing after the catastrophe, they tended to emphasise some of the externals, such as the phylacteries they wore and, and so on. And the reason was because 
What did they have to cling to? What defined them as Jewish people? And so the external things tended to be boundary markers and symbols of who we are as Jewish people. As, as for Catholics, in a generation or two ago, not eating meat on Friday was a boundary mark or a symbol for us. So the Pharisees tended to emphasise some of the externals, and we see it here in this passage. He's, Matthew is saying that they focused on the externals being impressive and so on. And the externals that he mentions are the phylacteries, and the phylacteries are the little uh, leather box that they had on their foreheads and strapped to their arms when they were praying. And those little leather boxes had um, passages from the Old Testament in them. They also had, he talks about the fringes on their prayer shawls and sitting in the front seats of the synagogue. If you're sitting at the front seats, you're actually looking at everybody else. And you look quite impressive, of course, sitting in the front seat. Also talks about titles. And of course, as Matthew's looking at this, he sees that the Jewish, uh, the, the, the Pharisees, really focusing on externals and losing the heart of it all. But he also says, this incipient clericalism, if you like, is not going to happen amongst us. It cannot happen amongst us. And what he is ultimately saying is, we've got to have humility. A great warning about the Pharisees is, we've got to have humility. Learn from me, from gentle and humble in heart. Whoever humbles himself like a little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So the, third, the second thing now in this first big chapter are the woes against the Pharisees. And it's pretty strong stuff. And people say, no wonder the early church was anti-Semitic and a history of anti-Semitism is in, within Christianity. But we'll take another little bit of a look at this. It's really a caricature of a group, of this group, who were trying to resuscitate Judaism and, and keep it going. And they're the enemy, if you like, of the early church. And in many places in uh, Palestine, you can see one village had a synagogue, another had a church, and so on. And the, the Pharisees themselves actually disliked hypocr hypocrisy. But it's, and it's Matthew, not Jesus, who's speaking. We've got to remember that. Matthew is facing the church of his day and the struggles of his day. And the strong language that he uses is common in polemical writing at that time and right through until almost our day. The 19th century, polemics is just as terrible sounding as that. So these woes, what are they? They're a form that prophets used to use, a way of speaking. Blessing on this person, woe on that. There are seven woes in Luke, but they're radically transformed by Matthew. And hypocrisy is not so much being phony, like what you say is and what you live, but it's rather being inconsistent and godless. It's lacking the, the real dimension of everything, which is God. And that's what we're, we're trying to worship God by the way we live. And that's what was disliked. So, I'll just look at uh, three of them briefly. You, you've taken the key of knowledge so that people can't get into heaven. Heaven is shut. If you remember that Matthew gave the keys of the kingdom to the disciples. So what he's saying in this about the Pharisees is that they, they keep heaven shut from others because of the way they live. Whereas the better way to live is to 
follow God's will. It's not those who say, Lord, Lord, that are going to enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. If you become like children, you'll enter the kingdom of heaven. And you know, Pharisees, the sinners and the tax collectors are, are getting into heaven before you. So it's a certain humility that the, uh, that the Pharisees don't have, and that's why they are unable to lead people to the kingdom. The fourth one, the fourth woe, just a word about that. And this is the central one. So it's sort of very important, of course. And they, he speaks about, Matthew speaks about, you're ignoring the weightier matters of the law. Justice, mercy and faithfulness. And of course that's exactly the heart of what Matthew doesn't like about their strict interpretation of the law, their following of human regulations. The way Jesus interprets the Torah is always by the guiding principle of mercy, justice, faithfulness. So it's rather clever because in the, in the Pharisaic system you give 10% of everything to, to the Levites and the priests and so on. And here... Even the smallest garden herbs, you've got to give 10%. Mint, dill and cumin. That sounds a bit strange, but it's, yeah, that's the way Matthew's putting it. And the last one, the seventh one is, you kill the prophets, as you're going to kill me. Jesus, though, rather, as you're going to kill Jesus. So there's great irony in all that there. You brood of vipers. The same words as John the Baptist used. So strong language against the Pharisaic way of living the Torah. And then finally, the third section of this, chapter 23, is the lament over Jerusalem. Very beautiful. Those last words that Jesus has. His last words over the city and over the temple and then he leaves. It has all the tenderness of the mother hand. The, it's a very beautiful moment. We can just see him crying and feeling so bad about it. And your house is left desolate. The temple is left desolate by me, the Messiah. It's a rather moving moment there as Jesus leaves. Okay, that's chapter 23. Let's move now into chapter 24 and 5. Chapters 24 and 5. The judgment to come. The coming judgment. Again, there are three sections in this. The first is Jesus' prediction of the coming judgment. The second is what one author calls the little apocalypse. About the future, what's going to happen at the end times and so on or the little eschatological discourse. And then the third section is seven parables and warnings. And the last three of those are quite famous. The ten bridesmaids, five are foolish and five are wise. The talents and the famous, very famous, magnificent last judgment. Okay, the first. The first section then of chapters 24 and 25 are Jesus' prediction of the destruction of the temple of the end times. As Jesus leaves the temple, he moves to the Mount of Olives and he sits down there. And he looks back over the city. That recalls, in a sense, from the prophet Ezekiel, how... When the temple was destroyed, God's presence left the temple and hovered for a while over the Mount of Olives before eventually going into pagan territory. It's quite interesting if we think of Jesus, he's the presence of God among us, leaving the temple, staying for a while on the Mount of Olives and eventually his presence will go to the ends of the earth. 
Jesus predicts the destruction of the temple. Not a stone will stand upon another stone. Now that's it's a, down in just a, a few verses, but it's a very significant thing. It's almost as though Sir Matthew is saying Jesus predicted something that happened because the, the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. And that's, of course, if we go, we will be looking at a little bit anyway, uh, the trial of Jesus, that's the substantial uh, accusation that is made against him. He's going to destroy the temple. The temple would, he's going to, or the temple will be destroyed. I find a little thing to say there is that the apostles then say, hey, when's it all going to come, Lord? And they sort of mean the destruction of the temple and the end times. The end times, the eschaton, the end times. Sometimes we could say the parousia. It's a lovely, great words, aren't they? Parousia means the second coming. And perhaps they're the same events. There's a hint there that they could be. We know, of course, that that, that hasn't happened like that. Okay, the second thing in this, these two chapters is the little apocalypse or the, the smaller eschatological discourse. I hate using these big words and I apologise for that. So what's, what's this all about? Well, eschatology and the apocalypse, those sort of... Apocalypse means unveiling or seeing. And we're seeing something about the end times that faith gives us a bit of an insight into. So we're privileged with our faith to be able to understand that there will be a time when the poor will be vindicated and the powerful will lose it all. And Jesus has foreseen that eventuality. That's what we're sort of paddling around with now. And he's seen it, he's warning us how to behave. So this little apocalypse, this strange chapter 24, verses 4 to 31, gives us the program, if you like, of what's going to happen. Aren't we lucky? We've got a program for the end times. And then after that, and that's the rest of chapter 24 and all of chapter 25, is going to tell us in seven parables and warnings how we should conduct ourselves. The material in this middle part, chapter 24, 14 to 31, is taken from Mark. And so Mark gives us the program of what's going to happen at the end of the world. And Q. Remember Q? That's that document that Matthew and Luke share and use, but use slightly differently in each case. So Q, what Q has at the end time is the sudden appearing of Jesus, the second coming without warning. And in Matthew's way of looking at it, we have the program of Mark, but the suddenness, and, and don't worry about when it's going to happen, just be ready, of Q tends to dominate. Matthew's description of what's going to happen, the program of the end of the world is this. There'll be birth pains first. That was the war and all of that, of the um, destruction of the city of Jerusalem. Then there'll be a time of great tribulation. There will be the great persecution of the elect from without, but also from within. From without, because the people will throw us in jail and all of that. But within, there'll be false prophets. And there'll be a lawlessness within our Christian communities. Because we won't be able to, people won't be keeping the Torah in the way Jesus wants us to keep it. And then so powerfully, the love of many will grow cold. The love of many will grow cold. And then after the false prophets and lawlessness, 
there will be the great affliction, the abomination of desolation, which is a marvellous expression, but it goes right back to an event that happened in 167 BC when the Greek king Antiochus Epiphanes IV came into the temple and placed a statue of Zeus, which was the abomination of desolation. How on earth could a statue of a non-god be placed in the Holy of Holies where we don't have a statue? So for Jewish people, that was, that was the worst thing to happen. So something's going to happen like that. Something as bad as that's going to happen again. As sacrilegious as that will happen again. So birth pains, the great, the time of great tribulation, and finally, the parousia, the second coming itself. Jesus will appear publicly, on clouds, whatever, and there'll be a great cosmic event announcing his coming. Earthquakes, the sun, the sun will no longer shine, etc., etc. And then all human beings will somehow or other beat their breasts or mourn. We're not, a, we're not really sure of why. It may be because of those beautiful words about they will look on, they will look on the one whom they have pierced and mourned. It, we're not sure of that. And then he's going to send his angels to get the harvest ready, the end times ready. Okay, now we go to the final section of this second, chap second part we're talking about, chapters 24 and 25. The final section is pretty long. It's the seven parables and warnings. So I won't talk about the four first ones, about the fig tree, or the days of Noah, or the thief coming in the middle of the night, or the good and wicked servants. We'll just leave them. But I will talk about the ten bridesmaids, the talents and the last judgment. Not a lot on them, but just a little. The ten bridesmaids. We're into chapter 25 now. This is unique to Matthew. The story itself is a little bit far-fetched. How many grooms have met their uh, brides at midnight? And is it a bit strange? that uh, midnight trading is is there in Palestine to go and get some oil. So that's all a bit, you know. Well, we've got to look on it as an allegory. We've not got to worry about whether it makes sense or not in, in that sense. So the, the groom, of course, is Jesus. The wise, the foolish virgins are us, the church. Some of us are wise, some of us are foolish, meaning some of us have oil in the lamps, other of us don't. And what is the oil? The oil is mercy, justice and faithfulness. It is the great commandment of love. And when the foolish ones say, Lord, Lord, open the door for us, of course we remember it isn't those who say, Lord, Lord, that are going to get into the kingdom. It's those that do the will of my Father, as the wise versions did. So it's really about making sure we have the oil of mercy and love always ready, so that when the bridegroom comes in the middle of the night, we're ready. Parable 6 is the talents. This is from Q. Q common to Luke. It's in Luke. There it's slightly different. There are two, two parables mixed in Luke. And also it's all about pounds, giving pounds. But now we're giving, you know, years wages because we're giving talents. Originally it was probably a story about the kingdom. A wealthy man who knows the, the gifts of each of his servants just gives them some money. Well, that's it. It goes away. 
He doesn't tell them to do anything with it, just gives them some money. The third one does nothing and loses everything. Well, that's, that's the extraordinary thing. And even what he has is given to somebody else. So it's a parable, probably, as Jesus says, about the kingdom. We have to do something. We can't just do nothing. And as Jesus, as St. Matthew places it here, he's more or less saying, we can't, the same thing really, but we can't get by and enter the kingdom by doing nothing. We've got to risk living well by loving and by doing works of mercy and justice. And finally now we come to the last judgment. This is unique to Matthew. And this is one of the most remarkable scenes in the whole of Scripture. It's one of the great defining texts for how we live our faith. It's the climax of Matthew's Gospel before the Passion and Death of Jesus. These are the last words, the last image of the last discourse. It's the only scene we have in the New Testament to depict what the last judgment is. It comes across to us as a, a remarkable scene or drama, really, of the end times, of the second coming of Jesus. Now, it's the climax of Matthew for a few reasons. Firstly, here we see finally the triumph of the kingdom of heaven. Here we see who Jesus really is. Can I just take you through some of the things that are said about Jesus in this? The Son of Man is coming in glory. He's the shepherd who will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And then the king will say, to those on his right hand. And then they will say, Lord, Lord. And then Jesus will judge. Come to me or go away from me. So we see in this one scene, Jesus as son of man, shepherd, king, Lord, judge. Most extraordinary portrait of Jesus. But finally, and perhaps this is the remarkable thing about St. Matthew's Gospel, it's the triumph of love. Of that guiding principle that Jesus kept teaching by which we interpret the law, the Torah. And it's those, what we've called in our tradition of faith, the corporal works of mercy. That's what it's all about. Those six corporal works of mercy. It's what we do, not what we say. It's not by saying, Lord, Lord, that we're going to enter the kingdom of heaven, but by doing the will of my Father. The will of my Father is to show love and mercy. It reminds me very much of Paul write into the Corinthians in that famous passage, 1 Corinthians 13, I may have all the knowledge there is, the gifts, extraordinary gifts of prophecy, but if I lack love, I'm nothing at all. I may even give my body to be burnt, but if I have love, it will do me no good whatsoever. Extraordinary vision of Paul, is the extraordinary vision of Matthew. Sure, in different contexts, but it's the same faith. And we're privileged, really, to be going through Matthew and to arrive at this point where once again we touch into the heart of it all. And the heart of it is what we do towards our neighbour, the love that we have for the little ones. Thank you.